Hey, Mike. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I got to do the music thing again and get my ears. I'll be okay. Right Sounds good. Hi, Ed. Hey, Michael. How are you doing? Uh, you know, Southern California. Yeah. <laughs> I used to know how it was. I lived in uh, San Jose for 14 years. Yeah. How are you doing in Germany? What's the weather oh, like there? Doing just fine. We were down south where I used to live for about four yeah. days. Yeah. So, that was the longest I ever lived anywhere. Well, we lived down down by Stuttgart. Oh wow! Yeah. How long have you been in Germany? Uh, this time, twenty one years, and the first time I was here, eleven years. Wow! So, wow! I came over with the military in the in the early seventies and was was stationed here in Bad Hersfeld. Uh huh. And then I stayed here. I took a European out and stayed here. I met my wife. We got married about a year after I got out. Uh huh. Um, and uh, I taught at a German boarding school for eight years. Yeah. What uh, What service were you in? I was in the army. Oh, okay. I was in military intelligence. I I was a plain clothes. I I was a spy. Uh huh. I was in overt intelligence collection. It was called. So I was one of the spies. Everybody knew who they were. <laughs> so you can relate to Doug's uh, covert. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's that's how that went. But so I'm 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 now living where I first was first stationed. But oh wow! After after in 1983 we moved to California, and I and I was there for 14 years, and then then we came back and we moved to southern Germany. And so I lived down around, I lived in a little wine village. It, well, it's actually a city. It's the second smallest city in Baden-Württemberg. And it's got about, I don't know, total population, about 4,000 people. It's, it's a real small, small place. But it's it's nestled in this valley, and it's nothing but vineyards as far as the eye can see. It's kind of like Napa Valley in, yeah. uh, of Germany. So. Yeah, so you it was a, real nice, a nice place to live. You've been through a lot of history with Germany the last 30 years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's been a lot going on. Of course, when the, I was here because of the wall or the fence, actually. When we you go out to the border, it was just a fence. But uh, it came down when we were in the States, but uh, which oh. was kind of ironic. But it's probably <laughs> a good thing, too. <laughs> it, was, it was a bit of a challenging transition here once the, yeah. when the border was in bumps. And, there's still a few issues issues that haven't been resolved. Yeah. yeah. I figure people live in the one one in one cultural setting for 40 years, whatever political setting we'll call it. It's going to take you about 40 years to to readjust. You know, it's going to it's about one for one. And I think so that's all, a good yeah. good guideline. Yeah. yeah. So so all went on 89. So we're looking at about 29 things should start. <laughs> So, yeah, I have the same guideline as far as being married for 18 years. It's almost 18 years since I've been divorced. So yeah, yeah, and, and, and now <laughs> you you start now coming to a sense of normalcy of some kind. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah it just it just it's just you know we're we're creatures of habit. And, oh, definitely. And it, takes, and it takes us a long time to undo. You know, we learn them real, you know, bad ones. We can learn real quickly. I can drop of a hat. I can get a bad habit. But <laughs> it takes yeah. forever for me to get up. <laughs> yeah, but fortunately, uh, there is an option. We can change our habits. Well, we can. That's right. I, I believe. <laughs> you know. I divorced my wife, so I changed my habits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the longest term starts and, and it, with a small step. And it wasn't, it wasn't a nun's habit either. It wasn't yeah, a nun's okay. habit. A <laughs> Hi, Doug. How are you doing? Contemplating divorce here now. 
No, we're just we're just kicking no. around the no normal things of life. You know? Are you able to hear me or understand? I'm, we're able to hear you loud and clear. Great. I'm um, always good. showing one or two bars on my phone, so I don't know what that yeah, means for yeah. reception. Doug, where are you today? That's a new background. This is my <laughs> my office. So I'll be here for 30 minutes, and then after that, I'll be puttering back around the, the town in a car. I'll probably in the, listen in. <laughs> back in the van, down, down, by the, down by the river. I'm not, not that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so free will again, huh? Yeah. Uh, okay, we'll start. I'll start since I... <laughs> Threw this yeah. out there. Your show <laughs> again. It's not my. It's not my intention to do this. That's fine. That's but fine. It, I'm glad you do. It was Monday. It was Monday, and nobody came no. forward. So well, clearly yeah. something's working. Or somebody would say, "Well, I can do this better," and they'll respond with a, a different topic. But you're the only one, so that says but, something. Better or worse, I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah. So. Should I, did everybody watch that, that little exchange between Wright and, and what's his name, Caruso? Is that, did it, is, so I just that, finished, I just finished uh, listening to the first half and then running through the second half. And um, I need some drugs after listening to that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. That. That conversation just tore me apart. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, why don't you you talk more about that, or should I, or should I summarize what I think was going on? I think I want to spin off of your summary. <laughs> 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 I don't want to. I don't. I, I don't want to jump in the deep end of the pools of shit. Okay. Okay. And, and here's, here's what I got out of it. And it just popped up on my, on my YouTube feed that morning. And mm -hmm. I thought it, I thought it was very interesting and fit sort of uh, in general, all sorts of things that we've been talking about in the cafe. Uh, because it is, at its root, a philosophical discussion that we're having here. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, and, and Robert Wright, the host, I've been familiar with for, since his first book, The Moral Animal. And, and I think he's a, a pretty good thinker. And his, his, uh, his current book is, Buddhism is true. Uh, so any, anyway, they, they sort of start out with the three waves of existentialism. The first one, uh, starting with uh, Nietzsche, and, and he declared God is dead. Uh, and I was alive then. <laughs> and and I saw I, I sort of remember that and 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 of course all this comes off of Darwin in 1889 publishing the Origin of Species and and so Nietzsche thinks about this and and he says well by golly uh, if if God isn't running the universe what you know what's going on and so that's the sort of birth of uh my, the first wave of existentialism which basically and i i read your comment ed about uh wilson and yeah. and i i don't even know if if he counts because he called he, he was talking about optimistic optimistic existentialism Yes. Which is kind of an oxymoron. I mean, existentialism is anxiety, angst about, you know, the 
the nature of things. It's like but that, that's one that's one way to define if the if the root of the word is existence, then one can look at it in an apprehensive way, or one can look at it in a non-apprehensive way to begin with. Well, so, I think, and and we we've talked about this that religion prior to Darwin, obviously there were people who were thinking about this, but it wasn't you know, in the public domain, really, uh, there was always God and God gave, and religion and God gave order and, and, uh, comfort and purpose to the events of the, what was happening. And then, and then Darwin came along and then Nietzsche, Nietzsche and Nietzsche said, by golly, God might be dead, and we're on our own. And so people got, you know, that created this angst. Like, if there is an order, what, what, what's, you know, what are we to do? And, and the second wave of existentialism, and I took philosophy almost 50 years ago, existentialism, and I gave all my books to my son, because he majored in philosophy. So, but Sartre sort of said, well, we're free. So we can do whatever we want. And people, that freaked people out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh my, oh my God. Uh, if we're totally free, that became overwhelming. So they were anxious people humans anxious again uh and and that was kind of secular saying okay god doesn't exist so it's up to us and sorry that's okay i get it I, i'm gonna put it on i'm gonna put it on mute now <laughs> uh that that sartre and second wave existentialism was was a the radicalness of freedom. If you're totally free, what, you know, that's reason to worry. And so this third wave existentialism is now looking at evolutionary theory and neuroscience. This guy called it neuro existentialism mm -hmm. in that we're not free. Actually, with the new science study in the brain that pretty much everything is, is, is going according to biological impulses. So, so, and, and that's a problem because if we're, if first we were, First we were under God's domain, then we were free, and now we're not free again. So there's all this existential angst again. And he he brought up uh, compatibilism, which is trying to reconcile both determinism and free will. And then they go into uh, what's known as game theory, which is, and they talked about the deserted island and crime and punishment. Uh, at what, if, if we're not free, how can you hold people responsible for what they do? And, and then they use the deserted island. If the, uh, you, find the, you find the Nazi 50 years later and he hasn't done anything bad for like 50 years and he's, you know, do you still hold him accountable for what he did 50 years ago? And, and so I, I find that all really interesting and particularly with what's going on today with the, the Kavanaugh uh, Supreme court justice situation and, and false memories and, it's just a fascinating uh, confluence of events. And I was interested into what everybody else thinks.
<laughs> Mike. Well, first of all, I don't know if I have a leg to stand on, but I, I really am tired of either or thinking and ways of, of framing things like they did in the conversation. I, it, it just, it, it, to me, it, 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 it makes me anxious. <laughs> <Literally>. <laughs> that was makes one anxious. <laughs> and, and so on that basis, it is existential, you know, and just a side note, I thought Nitsky, what he was saying with God is dead was my understanding, very specific, the way we've been enculturated to think of God, hmm. not, not that he didn't feel that there was something larger than himself, but he was he was taken upon himself. I'm going to have a personal relationship to what universe or life throws at me. And I'm not going to I'm not going to allow some institution like the church specifically that has. Trying to tell me what to do and and not allow me myself to think freely and. The thing is, is that when we start thinking or are addicted to thinking in terms of it's either determinism or it's free will. And I'm not I think I agree with them. I'm not too sure about this compatibility thing. I'm not sure I'm, I'm reserved about that. I just I just don't believe or in my experience, it's that black and white because I don't. I don't get the sense that everything is just biological, and maybe that's just, that's 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 where I'm, I, you know, uh, because biological to me is just my feet on the ground. But let me put it this way: I'm going to share an experience that that I've shared with Doug. That and 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 it's real to me. But I had an experience one time about five, six years ago of laying on the earth, laying on the earth, falling into a meditation. And it was a it wasn't so much a trance, but it was a relaxed state. And actually. Feeling on at the same time, feeling myself on the earth and be, having a perspective of knowing that the earth appears to from that perspective as existing in nothing and it's not falling and it left me with an ongoing core trust that nothing is just black and white there's more than i can perceive is any of this making sense i'm sorry but that's the way i've it's a whole lot I making a whole lot with, i have trouble with the way they even frame the argument because it, it, it started off just black and white there there was no there was no other third option and i that doesn't mean compatibility it means well two two things that seem to be opposed exist at the same time and i don't know if they're compatible but they do exist at the same time i think i think that's a fair to put out you know, because why would we be thinking that way? <laughs> Where does that come from? If that makes sense. I think it makes a whole lot of sense, Michael. And um, if I can just dovetail in on that. I would have liked to have, have had got a nickel. For every time they used an ism or an ist in that country. <laughs> Because I, I I could go on holiday. I get <laughs> it was I was just I was overwhelmed by how many isms you can pack into one sentence, and they may or may not be compatible. But it's but it all but all isms are either or. And this is where I'm on on the same way as uh, you, Michael. This, this this whole interview, I talk a lot in, in terms of Gapser, but it is it was really the the prototypical example of the rational structure of consciousness. If you ever read Gapser and didn't know what he was really meant by that, you could watch these this 50 minutes and you would know precisely what was going on. And it, and it, and it boils down to that. There's an 
absolutivity that is presupposed, and it has to be one or the other. And and the, and the thing that I find most fascinating about life in general is it's never one or the other. There's always this multi, there's always this plentitude of, of options that have to be, you know, we talk about taking the left or right. But yeah, we do a lot of that, I can tell you. <laughs> and, a, and a lot of this too, but, you know, because we're moving all over the place. But it's, you know, we talk about it, you know, like the, the, the road not taken. It should actually, you know, Frost's poem should have been the roads not taken. You know, you might come to a why at this place, but you pass, I don't know how many others before you got there, because you're always being presented with these options. And I, I have... I have just generally, for about as long as I can remember, have had a trouble with the reductionism that, which is an ism, but this reducing of everything to either wars. And so, and so I found it, I found it amusing, but it was really hard to take because um, you can, you could tell Greg, Greg being a, a philosophy professor, I guess, has to take positions on things. And so I'm very much of this that I don't know if I am that and I don't know if I can ascribe to this, this other thing. And I'm still on the fence about the third thing because the third thing is too much for most of them. I mean, he's a really nice guy and he's, he's real smart. And, and, and but, you know, he had the perfect, he had the perfect uh, interview partner that, that allowed that to, to come out. And I just think that there are, there are multiple options. I, I read Nietzsche the same way that Michael has. It's not this absolute declaration. Even if it were an absolute declaration, how would Nietzsche know? You know, is, is he like smarter than everybody else? He, he was a good writer. He was a very clever individual. I mean, there's lots of people on earth that are smarter than me. Don't, don't get me wrong. But you know, like, is he the smartest guy that's come down the pike? And all of these people have been very smart, but they, the only thing they can tell us in the end is what they think. And what they think is what they think. But it has to... It has to fit in with the way I think about things and the way I experience things, because I have had a sim an, an experience very different but similar, if that makes any sense, to what Michael had. You have one of the, you just, you get these, and this is what Colin Wilson was talking about, peak experiences, using those as the basis for our existentialism and not the anxiety side of it. That's what I find interesting about him. So we have these experiences to go, well, how does this fit into anything? And up until now, I haven't found anything that it fits into. Yeah. And and I'm perfectly fine with that. That's why I don't have this existential angst that so many uh, which many, many people do. But I don't I don't I, I happen not to have. It well, because it, it's really not. It, I haven't figured it out yet, but I, I ha kind of have a sense it is <laughs> figurable outable. <laughs> I like that. You know, kind of thing. It, you like you may not really get it, and you'll never get it all. I don't think you get it all at once, but but it, it, but it can be gotten. That yeah. that was a, the one clue I was. Getting. It can be gotten, but you're going to have to work to get it. Well, and I think I mean this probably comes into play with my centering prayer and and Zen meditation is, and I I'm going to include what I've understood of some of the neuroscience, because I've read some of the neuroscience that they were talking about, is anxiety itself, when you practice meditation to work with that feeling, to be with that feeling, is a biological activation, chemical reaction, to actually maybe get you to change what you're doing. It, changing is anxious. And I think there's a value in honoring the anxiety. And that's what I take from the existential is stop pushing the anxiety away. You're living in a fucking universe that's bigger than you are. And it scares the shit out of you. You know, so start from ground zero. You know, start, sit your ass down, sit down and 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 learn to work with Obviously, I, I'm of the opinion that my very body is part of the earth. So maybe if I pay attention to this body that it has, uh, even on an elemental level, uh, the same makeup as the earth. Hmm. Maybe I need to kind of see where that, you know, just as a thought experiment, as a meditation, mm -hmm. maybe that's what I need to tie into to to not necessarily know everything, but how do I fucking navigate this fucking <laughs> billion-starred universe? And and that's the universe 
but the planet Earth is is big. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just the planet Earth is big, and then and then I'm a small little creature, you know. But I I I personally, from my practice of meditation, it is practice. And I feel that it's not just Buddha, but some of the religious figures that got misconstrued is sit down, shut up, pay attention to what's going on inside and out, inside and out. There is, you know, there is a division, but that's just functional. It's not a real division. I have to breathe air or I wouldn't exist. Does, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm so passionate about when are we going to really understand and i am playing with words mark it's not the perfect words but biology to me is a life study it's studying life and i don't know i have to be humble about that mm-hmm. so i think there's more than the scientific notion of biology in in the way that we've obviously come to use the scientific method similar to meditation of focus your attention pay attention bring some rather than letting the anxiety go to either you're going to freeze you're going to fight or you're going to run away i think there in the history of mankind there's people that have taught themselves not to need to respond to any of those choices just pay attention pay attention (laughs) you know and for actually i think freeze the freeze element of our biological when we're told to freeze is probably the healthier one because i translated like zen meditation sit down shut up and pay attention (laughs) you know pause Slow down. <laughs> we have intelligence in our bodies that we don't give ourselves credit for. So that's my soapbox, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, I think. Uh, I think all of that feeds into the human condition, which is this desire to understand. Mm -hmm. And, And the meditation part, the Buddhist meditation part, is sort of setting that aside and just just being rather than trying to figure things out well i i, I want to real quick interject that the way i feel it's not putting aside the human condition it's being very focused what in the fuck is this human condition so well that's a it, as as i look at uh meditation there's there's two two tracks and this okay. is just okay personal one is um, you meditate on something okay and and there you're paying attention and, and trying to figure something out okay and the other is you're trying not to figure anything out fair you're, enough you're yeah. just letting everything go by which is okay. maybe more difficult yeah no, much more. Yeah, you know, you always have because your mind is just it's it's just tuned into uh, figuring things out in sure. in or or reacting. So yeah. so you have these two, and I don't even know the, the the formal definition of the two types of meditation, or if there's two types of you know, it's just I I I am. Have, done both but in the end you sort of have to return to what i call real life and where the anxiety comes into right Uh, Right. and and 
there's there's something that I come back to. It's like a real life experiment, but it wasn't an experiment done by scientists. A couple of year couple of years ago on the uh, Appalachian Trail, some bones were found, and with the bones was a uh, you know a smartphone. <laughs> Yeah. So, so the person and, and they were able to identify the person and, and there's a life history and everything. It was a, I think she, it was a female 60 some years old mm. and, and she's <laughs> to me, it's like crazy. What was this person thinking? Um, she was 60 some years old and, and uh, decided for whatever reason uh, to, hiked the Appalachian Trail with a friend as, you know, sort of a therapeutic uh, uh, experience. You know, it'd be good to hike in the wilderness alone. But she suffered from anxiety and was on, on anxiety medication. So they're hiking along and everything seems to be fine, but then her friend has to go back to civilization. So the, the person whose bones were found decides to continue on by herself. She's got her medication. She's got her smartphone. But, of course, in lots of places in the wilderness, yeah. the, the, the phone is no good, other than you can tap little notes and stuff like that, but you can't connect to the universe Right. in, in so much as – the phone allows you to connect to the universe other than your own you know, mm-hmm. psyche. Right. Right. So according to the notes on her phone, she has to, she has to relieve herself. And this is biological. Mm-hmm. So she goes off the trail to do that. And she loses her orientation. Yeah. And, and her, at some point her, her, medication runs out oh wow and she she was i mean to me it's almost like the whole thing is crazy but they have the bones and they have the notes on her on her on her smartphone right right it took her it took her 26 days to expire oh wow because she starved to death right i think she I think, as I recall, she found some water close by, but there there was no food, and she just thought that it best to just stay put. Right. And and this was several. The article I read a year or two ago, and and and, uh, but the bones, it, it was just a skeleton. It, it, so she was like, I don't know, three or four years old. Wow. I, I, it just, it speaks to biology. It speaks to a lot of things. In other words, it doesn't, it, it, sooner or later, biology takes over. You have to eat, you have to breathe, you have to take in water, all, uh, all these sorts yeah, of things. Right. And, and yeah. you are a biological creature, although in this, this forum, I think s- some of the people and, 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 and I dropped, I just looked at Aurobindo and said, I've been there, done that. I don't need to do this again. Uh-huh. So one of the, one of the solutions to the world situation regarding humans, mm-hmm. uh, there's like, there's like five, uh, five possibilities, solutions. Let's see, I wrote the, there's, there's the noble, because what has happened, there's so many of us. We've been so successful as a species, as a biological creature, that we're destroying our habitat. I think most people would agree with that. And, and hey. steps, have been, steps have been taken to, to like where I live in, in the Denver area, the air used to be horrible. It's not anymore. It's they've cleaned it up. It's great. <laughs> and that'll change. You got a president working on it. Uh, 
let's set that aside for the time being. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> let's set that aside for the time. But, Mark, can I ask you a question? Sure. Can I ask you a question? Because this is something I need to ask you in listening to you. So is everything just reduced down to biology? Well, I think that's an unknowable. So it's an open question, too. Yeah, I sort of lean towards that compatibility in that I I believe free will is an illusion. Mm -hmm. And I said this a long time ago, but it's necessary. Yeah, it's a workable illusion. <laughs> we have we have to hold people, and that's these people, those two guys got into it at the end. We have to hold people accountable, otherwise, what the you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so we can't. So, can I can I interject one question? Sure. sure. We, you, I agree with you. We, we probably have too many humans on the planet. I wouldn't say that that's a success. And if that is success in biological terms, what's biology doing about it to to change that? Okay, well, I'm getting to that. Okay, I'm getting, All right. I'm getting the the normal the natural consequence when a when a species uh, starts to uh, outlive its resource uh, base. Base, thank you. <laughs> is that they start to die off? Deaths go up mm -hmm. by one reason. One something happens so that the the fertility rate starts to decline, and 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 then till they reach an equilibrium again, or they they can extinct out. Mm -hmm. They can they can consume all the resources, which is sort of the problem that is looked at by biologists. There's so many people. And if everybody consumes at the rate of North America, there's just, there's not enough to, 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 to keep up with the expanding population. So, so there's five, five ways to deal with this. One is called the noble savage which is a return that's that in the old prehistory people had everything grew you know they lived with nature and and you know they had everything kind of figured out that's sort of the magical look at things and and the second the second way you solve that is you reduce fertility and and We've done it. We, America, has done a pretty good job of that with birth control. But it's almost insignificant unless you can get buy-in from the entire population, world population. And everybody agrees to, you know, only have one kid or something like that. Well, that doesn't seem feasible. And the, the third one is to reduce consumption which seems like the rational idea like i that's sort of what i think i do mm -hmm. sort of the minimalist approach uh but again you got to get you got to get buy in because if yeah if i reduce my consumption but let's just use your example but trump is just consuming like crazy mm -hmm. yeah uh, uh so, so that's the third one. It's rational, but again, you got to get buy-in from everybody, which is politic. These are political solutions. The fourth is what's known as eco eco feminism, and that takes the position that it's sort of it's a male problem that we're we males are the problem because we're so competitive and and and, and we just. We're the we're the cause of of the problem of overconsumption. Uh, that females are much nicer and kinder, and gentler, and we're just you know. So if if we can flip the the ruling power so that females sort of rule the earth, they'll figure it out because they're much more 
rational, if you will, than men. And the fifth one, the fifth solution is, and I think this is sort of where the group is. I think the group is sort of for ecofeminism, and the fifth one is technology to the rescue. That, that we'll either leave Earth <laughs> and go to another planet, or just out in the out in the the the, the news sphere, either either mentally or actually, but we'll use technology, and that's sort of the artificial intelligence will take over and eventually extinct us people, humans. And, and you know, we'll create, it, it's sort of, I don't, it was it 2001 with how the computer mm -hmm. takes over? Yeah. So those are five, five ways to solve the problem of the biological problem of humans overpopulating the planet, the third rock from the sun that we're on. But I would maintain every one of those involves a human choice. And I would maintain that biology created the problem. It's up to biology to solve it. Biology will solve it. And, we don't have to do anything. Is, well, then we don't have to do anything. Yeah, but it, it, it's sort of like who, who dies? We are, we're, I'm going to let you in on a little secret, Mark. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> what? <laughs> Sooner or later, for better or worse, we're all going. You know, nobody gets out of here alive. Okay, so that's that's the that's the first given. Well, but but, but what what is happening in? Yeah, but this is. I, I don't know exactly how to answer ask the question, because it would seem to me that there might there must be something going on biologic, and this is what I expect from biologists, and I never hear. Okay. What what is actually happening in the biosphere to reduce human reproduction. And I don't know what it is. And if there's nothing, then it's not, it's, it's an end to the problem, but it's not a solution. Can I answer? No, please do. I, That's why I asked the yeah, question. Yeah, my, my interpretation <laughs> or, or my understanding, belief, whatever, is that we, we humans with technology have successfully eliminated biological controls and that natural selection no longer is functioning. And with the global connected community, which I do not deny, uh, uh, we are aware of other people suffering. And that's, and then what do we do about it? Suppose, yeah, suppose, let's use Ebola. If it, there was an outbreak in Africa, what, a couple of years ago? And without technology, which was modern medicine, it could have devastated that continent. But we, in the Western world, were aware of the situation and came to the rescue via our our technology or medication and things because we we don't like to see we have this we don't want a biological s solution we don't want to see because of that again cameras and what we don't want to see people suffering terrible death we just yeah well we wouldn't see them anyhow because nobody shows that well the united states the United States is all over the world killing people by the day, but we don't see it on TV. That's I true. watch the Vietnam War on TV, and they don't do that anymore. They don't even show that to you. You don't even get to see it, but it's happening. Oh, you see it on uh, you see it now on uh, documentaries, which yeah, are that, after the fact, sanitized, yeah. whatever. Yeah, which, which so are you don't see it real time. You don't see it so that it actually affects you. You know, I used to eat dinner. You know, remember remember TV the. Uh, TV dinner, TV dinner tables, you know, because everybody said, "Yeah," and you watch, you watch the body counts, and you watch people slogging through the mud, and you saw them carrying dead bodies all over the place. You know, we don't do that; we've sanitized all that. You know, but but you're but you're saying, or what you're recognizing is that our 
our current status of technological development has just put an end to 15 billion years of biological evolution. So we can say that we're in control of our evolution through right. human I, I think, action? I, I agree with that. Well, well, not from human action, but with the, with the interaction of or human, human thinking, I guess, and what with, we've created. With technology with, and, and eventually artificial intelligence. A superior, so we think, to ours because a robot doesn't care about it, it, it doesn't even know your president, but that doesn't, that's beside the point. <laughs> that's why that's one reason why he's so successful. I well, it all depends on it, all depends on what you call success. I don't, I don't think that it that overpopulating is a biological success story. I think that shows you the limits of what you're capable of doing if you've only got one track to follow. And, and I think the thing that, that I also hear you saying is technology is opening up another track. I don't think it ends biological evolution. It might give it a different positional value in the scheme of things. But, well, what is, but I also is, don't think that we're as near to any of the things that I know that we have a lot of techno files uh, in in the group and i don't agree with any of them because we don't have any intelligence in artificial intelligence there's none there there's certainly no you know there's certain things that that machines or computers can do more quickly than humans do but it's not any better it's the same stuff in the end but in, in a way maybe that's that's what it can do if it can do it quicker than us then that i'm not I wouldn't group myself in the technophile. Like I, yeah. I hardly know about technology, but I, I feel like it. Some of our technology knows us better than we know ourselves. Maybe not us here, no, but no, no, there's so many people know. relying on. It doesn't know. It can't know. Anything. But it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to know anything. I'm not talking about that part. Of it it right. has to know enough about us to to where it we rely anything. on it. It doesn't know anything about it. It can't know about us. What knows? Okay, then. So what word should I use right now so I can get past this part of it? I just said there's a lot of data that's accumulated that yeah. it processes. So it has a lot of data about us mm -hmm. to yeah. tell us what we don't know about ourselves. And that goes no. back to the neuro no. Ex no. existentialism. No, it doesn't, it doesn't well, maybe not you. you. It tells other people who want to listen. Give me, give me, okay, <laughs> give me an example of what it knows about us that we don't know. So, for example, it knows the algorithms to define potentially this last election. And maybe it was just a few Russians, or maybe it was this person who decided to start a Facebook group to spread this information. And it knows what, we're, how, what will make us react. Um, it's based on human interaction with the technology. Maybe a better example would be, um, so Michael wants to go find himself another woman. Um, he knows in the past that he's not liked the previous examples of women who he's been married to. So he's going to go to the algorithm that will match him up to somebody he would never find in I, real I life want interaction. That, I want that algorithm. And so he, he, he wants it and it's, it's out there because he can type in certain information or whatever. And of course there's no thinking behind the, the data, but it's enough thinking that it, Michael says, yeah, I want that. I want to meet the next woman. I, I, I don't know what I want for myself, but this algorithm knows what I want I better to, than I do. I have to feed the a a algorithm, right? I have to put in some data. So from, yeah, right? it doesn't magically know who you are, but with the data that, and maybe 30, 40 years in the future are my children, which I keep away from technology as much as possible, but there's going to be enough accumulated personal data to say, okay, well, this is the college you're going to. This is who you're going to marry just based on these out. It might not be fully here yet, but it, that that's the problem I see is that our, our little bit of free will or our thinking of what we can and can't do is being easily influenced by advertising on the internet or the big four or five Facebook saying, Okay, well, it, it's shunning us from, so if you're focused on liberal news, you're not going to see any conservative news, and you're going to form away from 
the ability to make a rational decision. Um, so I, I don't yeah. know if it's fully there yet, but it's approaching that. It's, it's more of a, go ahead. I actually want to put forth to three of you, this idea that I have is, and it is influenced by Marshall McLuhan, but it's an idea I really, I think the technology today is we've overextended the technology that's in our own, our own bodies are made of. We've overextended and forgot that we still need to understand this, my body, my, even my ego, that's part of my body is a technology for this life form to operate. Uh, we're, we're already a medium. We're a media in our own bodies and minds. And we're a media that's embedded on this planet with culture and family. And what I see, and this is probably, I'll just own it. It's probably a result of my tractor accident. This is where I'm getting this metaphor is I operated a piece of machinery in such a way so poorly because I wasn't paying attention to my body senses when I'm operated that I went over the edge. I overextended myself. If, if you follow what I'm trying, my, metaphorically, what I'm trying to say is I lost touch with my, the seat, my butt in the tractor. And I was lost. I was literally lost in thought about a fight my wife and I had. That was, that was going to be my question. If you recall what you were thinking prior to or as the accident was happening, and right. that's a and and I think and, and I was just meditating on, on this. <laughs> uh, with, rega with regard to memory. Yeah, I think traumatic events. Memory isn't perfect. You don't have perfect recall. No. But you, you you tend to sort things out into pleasure and and pain trauma, but you fill in the you fill in the blanks with with uh, to make a story out of your mem the parts you do remember or recall, and pretty soon that memory shifts, and it may well, yeah, and it sure. may not be yeah. I agree, Mark. Fair enough. But I, I relate to my memory as not trying to be driven by factual stuff, but GPS. Where am I in this experience? Because it just, I don't know if I'm responding to you in the right way, but this is what I've come to find out. Just filling in the blanks that way and giving it a narrative and not needing for it to be factually one-on-one -on -one true. Uh, but at the same time, being humble enough to kind of not go down the road of trying to factualize my narrative. Does that make sense? I think so. I th and, In and other words, I, I don't want to turn my story into an absolute. I want to still keep open to data because there was other things that did happen that I ran across that 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 I just played with. One of them is one of them besides that is. The moment that I went over and I knew I was going over, I said, I'm gone, I'm dead. And then I woke up and I'm going, what the fuck happened here? How am I alive? Because as far as I was concerned, and, and, and it's a very concrete memory, but I'm not going to say it's an absolute. I'm not going to say it's factual. It's a meaningful memory for me, <laughs> I guess. I made sense of it that way, that... I, it probably was, I had surrendered and I, I just, I've done, I've spent the last 18 years, but the first five years were the hardest of, of accepting the fact I'm still alive. And I don't understand why, because as far as I was concerned, I should have been dead. So I, I take your point, Mark. I'm not, I'm not saying, but I think we need to understand that memory is a funny thing and you're right we can it can be morphed and everything but so what in a sense so what as long as you understand it's doing that that it has it functions that way 
it's still valuable in some way to me, at least from my experience, it still serves a function in a way, as long as I understand the limitations of its function. Does that make sense? Yes, I, yeah. I, I, think, I think that's good. But to pick up on what Doug was saying with the, with the algorithms and the artificial intelligence, that's, right. fu that's futuristic and they start to influence your story, your beliefs, That's your consumption. That's very true, because they become it's part of the environment. They, we are adding to the environment the way we're interacting on this planet. We're adding more by the way we either think logically or think crazy. We're adding to it, both. We're, we're changing it. Well, and, and, and what's happening is that and I don't know, Ed, what your circumstance is, but every time you, unless you're paying with, with gold nuggets or something, <laughs> if you don't, if you don't have a bank account and you're just, you're just winging it with, with, you know, gold dust or whatever, all the information about you is being tracked and stored. Yeah, and then and then used. Yeah, no, I I I don't deny it. I don't deny any of that. Where you I, go, I was what simply, you do. That's correct. But I but I am simply. I think it is a. I don't mean this as badly as it sounds, and I'm not criticizing anybody that does. But I don't think that that means that the machine knows. I don't think there's any knowledge involved in that. I, I know that it's being tried. I know that there's lots of data. I know that I, everything that I do say every time I make a search, well, not every time because I also, you, there are technologies that allow you not to have every search that you plug, you type think. into your computer be regard, huh? You think. Yeah, Somebody I, told I, I believe, I believe, yes, I believe. Um, and I think it, because it is technically feasible and I do understand enough about the technology to know that that is feasible. So that it could very well be that way. So I, I do realize that this is all being collected and I do realize that we're being um, subjected to, to um, advertising and propaganda at a, in, in, a, in, a, in a dimension and to, a, to an extent that has never before been this intense as we have it now. But I have I have a real problem with calling that intelligence because whatever that machine is doing, it was told to do by a human being. Those algorithms don't just appear. Those algorithms are thought up and they are devised and they're they're designed. There's somebody well, behind it designing them. The this idea, is, the idea. My favorite, my favorite example is every night. On German TV, five minutes before the eight o'clock news comes on, there's a show called The Stock Market Before Eight. And for five minutes, they tell us all about what's all going on in the stock markets and how the investors and this, that, and whatnot. And I look at this, and this is the most insane show on TV. <laughs> because this show has zero to do with any reality that we know. 95% of all stock trades are conducted by computers without human intervention. 95%. So what investors are nervous that they're causing the markets to go this way and whatnot? There's only 5% of trades that are actually conducted by human beings. And those for a very, very small exclusive segment, albeit large, financially speaking, of the investment community. This has, this has nothing to do with anything, but we get, we get told this is part of how we're being told what to think and how to think and why to think about it and, 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 and to react to things. And, and you look at this and go, well, this is just, this is nonsense. And, and I, th this comes back to what Mike's, Mike was saying, it's good to be aware, I can't change it. I don't think I wanna change it, but, it's good to be aware of that. It's good to be aware that my memories are faulty and I'm filling them in. It, that's good to be aware. It's good to know that that's knowledge for me. That's knowing how things function. That's why I think a lot of, you know, our science is extremely helpful. A lot of our technology is extremely helpful, but, I, but I'm very apprehensive about ascribing to that 
characteristics that it itself does not have or nor can it embody. Until the computer turns itself on, programs itself and does something, then we can start talking about it. Yeah, and, and, and I just briefly want to state that I'm right there with you, Ed, and when I, if I use intelligence or smarter than and machines in the same sentence, I, I just do. simply want you to, or whoever, to understand that I mean what you're stating there. And yeah, well, I, the problem I, is when, sure when people agree. rely on this yeah. knowledge, when people see it as defining their own decisions, and that, that's where the problem lies. Yeah. The yeah. stock market is a great example and probably the best one you can give. And that's a metaphor for anything else that I threw in, like Facebook yeah. algorithms or dating apps or whatever it might be. And it, it's approaching that speed too with where everyone that's not aware of their own thinking and their own ability to discern or, or even people that think they're able to discern <laughs> to a certain extent will, well, will be fooled and, by it too. But Yeah. And I, I make, I bring online my, you know, we're, we're all connected there. You know, that's a big concept. We're all connected, but to put it on a very, day-to-day -day level. I'm connected to my kids, but I'm not always in contact with them. I'm not right there with them, either through void, through, even through the technology. I get pissed at my kids when they don't return a call for 24 hours. Where's the contact? So the rub to me is whether it's artificial intelligence or interacting with another human being and I I I just feel we've we've we're, the anxiety is so high high because of what's happening in the world. Nobody wants to be in contact with each other, or they're very prejudiced. And I'm using that word on prejudging having contact with people that are different than them. And and what they understand about the brain right now and neuroscience, and I'll bring this online, is we have a negative bias that's biological mark that. Our sense of threat is dependent on how different you are. It's dependent on not if you're you're not threatened by somebody that you like or you're similar with. It's when a difference comes up, you know. And this is technology in our own body that I think we need to. That maybe the outside technology can help mirror back to us. That's one of the things we need to get back in touch with. Is they have plenty of data on on the brain right now that would help us through awareness training or different things to be in touch with the very technology that's inside our, in, in our bodies. And maybe we'd have a better relationship to the technology that we're just going crazy with trying to make ourselves feel safe because we've, in my opinion, we have operated with extreme low intelligence in terms of being living on this planet by having too many babies by being too greedy all, you name it you know and so would you say that it would be our, we have a faulty biological system in a certain sense or if the evolutionary path has led us to having kind I of a faulty biological and now we can hack the body in certain ways even right and right even in this book of buddhism he brought in neuroscience is we are, we've been uh, attached to unconscious with natural selection. His theme in that Buddhist book was with Buddhist meditation, we can actually be aware of that and make a different choice. Natural. We're not, we don't have to, we're at a point. We don't have to be uh, unconscious, ignorant. We can participate in a aware way with not natural selection natural selection is part of the body it's going to go either for the for the plus more it's going to go for the good more than the bad but those two exist and plenty of levels of where even cells will shy away from something negative and go to something thing well with human beings though we're complex we know that sometimes we actually and i'm just using my experience I had to use my Buddhist meditation to say, I actually need to go up towards the pain and have hip surgery. And, and yes, it was anxious, but because of Buddhist meditation, the anxiety didn't cause a panic for the surgery, but I trained myself 
two weeks before to work with the different levels going up to the surgery. I think that's a, a, a miraculous part of our, that we're not, we're gifted with in our own bodies. Is that, does that make sense? Yes. Well, I think as is often the case in these discussions, you're sort of making my point in that left to its own, left to your body's natural uh, condition, you probably would be dead. Because of the pain of the hip, you would have been, you're useless, you're discarded, you're history. But the anxiety, but of, the anxiety too. That's even secondary. But, no. Uh, yeah, you'd be like the lady, you'd be like the lady on the, the Appalachian Trail. Okay. It, 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 you know, you'd, you'd either accept your demise peacefully, or, but the technology allows you to continue living, which has a ripple effect. But the with, with your children and Mark, the technology is a supplement to how well I'm aware of what's happening in my body. And I disagree with you. This is where neuroscience is emotional intelligence of paying attention to our anxiety and give it in it just as much weight as concrete, whether with my body or not, concrete value that it's probably better when we pay attention and give attention to our emotions, whatever they are. That your example, I'll I'll pick it apart. That's One of the true. things that that lady didn't do that she hadn't uh, used her uh, or been in touch with her natural relationship to her body, you know, before she even went on the trip, you know, she just challenged herself. I want to know if she's ever walked that far. I'm saying that happened because she was ignorant of her own body, and she she was using her rational intelligence to ignore what her body could have told her this is what you have you need to do if you're going to walk that so i i i i i'm just falling on the other side that the biology has an intelligence we are not giving it enough attention maybe i can put it that way so i don't know how close you and i are I don't know how close we are. I, I, I just, you know, part of the rational thought from from the age of enlightenment and rational thought has been to dumb down and think of matter as nothing but dead matter. And that includes our own bodies. And I, I refuse to buy into that reductionism. I refuse. It's, it, it's totally not intelligent. And my definition of intelligence is that there's more than there's multiple perspectives of how to how to experience life. So, you know, um, I'm sorry. I just <laughs> thank you, Mark. Sure. <laughs> I'm not just a biological being either, too. I think that's one of the things I haven't expressed. I don't consider myself just a biological being. I'm still trying to figure out. I know I'm not just a biological being, but I'm still trying to figure out what that might mean to me. So I'm in the process of trying to figure that out. Well, I, th I, th I think that's the, the, the overall view of this cosmos cooperative is that mm -hmm. I, I, think I'm on, I think I'm an outlier. Uh, most of the people involved in this, the infinite conversations, believe in a mental uh, state in the new sphere above and beyond the biological and the third yeah, rock. I, from the I don't, I don't believe that way. I don't believe that way. 
Is there, an, I'm asking you, is there another possibility between other than those two? I'm just. I don't know. I don't know. I don't okay. think so. I don't. Okay, well, I, I'm just holding the question. I'm holding the question, the open question, that there's a possibility that's not tied to either or of those. Again, I hate. It, there, the only either or that I will accept is either I'm going to do something or I'm not. Making a choice not to do something, that's black and white. I'm either going to act or I'm not. But when it comes to my thinking and my feeling, no. I need to challenge those either or tendencies in me of a black and white thinking or even black and white feeling. I just... That, that's constricting to me that's constricting to me and I don't even think it's a matter of, a matter of trying to make a statement of free will it's it, it's constricting because life tells me that's a constricting life itself tells me that's constricting I don't know if it's free will or not but life sure does tell me that that's no way to live and you know as usual, this is just out of my own experience, which my own experience is not the only experience. That's why I come to these cafe and you may be an outlet liar here, but I resonate with you being an outlier because in other communities, I'm the one that's the outlier. <laughs> so I resonate with you as much as I may not agree with you. <laughs> I think, I think, yeah, there's all different ways that we do that in group, out group thing. Yeah. yeah. But everybody, but everybody does it. Yeah. Even the that's people true. who, even the people who deny it. Yeah. That very, those are the worst. <laughs> those are the worst. Uh, and, and, and that's a, I, I believe that that's a function of our, evolutionary history our survival mechanisms is and, in group and I, out group and and i agree i i agree it is a biological function but i also i don't know consider the notion of evolution that we don't have to just uh be defined by that evolutionary function as much as it yes it is part of it well i mean i can't deny it, but do I have to define myself by that evolutionary? That's a natural selection function. I get that. But do I have to define myself by that function? I don't personally think we do. Well, I think that's, I think we're at the, the point here in 2018 where this is, people are trying to figure it out. Yes, right. I agree. Uh, I agree. And yet they're still beholden to it, even though they may deny it. And, and I mean, it's the evidence is just overwhelming that people cannot escape the in-group, out-group thing. It's, it, we're, people are trying to. Right. Uh, but they wind up doing it anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I, I take your point, but I think it's discussion groups like this and and other people that and other people in my circle that I'm, you know, we all move in different groups, and uh, I try to be sensitive to the groups I move in, and and um, by doing that, at least without denying what you're saying, at least I'm doing my best not to. I'm doing my best not to get caught in in group out group, which doesn't mean, and this is I think is part of the problem with this whole issue of in group out group, because I've experienced more friction with the in a group than between group. I've gotten more trouble with, per se, my family because of the way I think, my own family. So, you know, uh, but you know I've. I've been challenged since my accident and it's and several things in my life, but especially the last 10 years experience life experience and shit happening has taught me. I need to 
pay attention when I'm operating from that in-group, out-group, even if I disagree with the group or the individuals in it. And that's been my practice, my way of turning it around, because I'm not going to give up my ideas. <laughs> I'm not going to give up my differences. <laughs> I just want us all to get along. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still a hippie at heart. <laughs> I'm just a hippie on steroids sometimes. But you're you're right, Mark. I think that's one of the biggest issues, and I ran across that. That was the biggest issues that Alan Watts noticed way back when I first entered this and started reading. Alan Watts brought to the that to the forefront. In in group out group. You know, and and aren't and aren't these a, a, a lot of these are based on uh, because of power and resources hoarding resources, and I think that I think that's just an extension of not understanding how our our brain um, has this negative bias toward uh, alarm system that needs to pay attention to what's different in the environment so that it doesn't get eaten, <laughs> you know, or something. But what I've learned from my trauma is, is not to react to that. I can, I can slow it down and be sure. Is this a credible thought, a threat, or is this just me being butthurt because somebody said something I didn't like? And believe me, I, I've had to deal with on the ground because I was a bouncer and and dealing with people that, you know, like Ed would, I, I'm going to try to channel Ed hands on <laughs> experience with dealing with that threat in my brain and how and, 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 and I have a boss that said, OK, Mike, you, you know, you can do this, but these are kind of the guidelines you have to at least work in as best as you can. And it was a learning skill. Don't get, I didn't learn that. I didn't learn. I didn't learn how to nuance that overnight. I had plenty of mistakes. Fortunately, I never had anybody. It, it was more a yelling match than it was a fisticuff only a couple of times. But I find it interesting that um, in Southern California, people don't like you being, this is my description, animated and speaking with passion to them. You're raising your voice and you're insulting them. <laughs> so I've had to deal with that myself. Fortunately, it's a very American phenomenon. What? what? That's a very American phenomenon. Yes. If you live in a culture like the Germans, which is... <clears throat> The Germans consider themselves direct. Americans consider them rude. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and it's because it's not people over here don't get as uptight as as quickly ah. if somebody says something very direct to them that is that is negative. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'll even get that in the supermarket. People, you know, don't cut into a line here. Right. But if there's no line been formed, be prepared that grandma's going to elbow you out of the way to get up to the top of the phone. Wow. Yeah, because there is no line. Trying trying to, you know, we used to go to a pharmacy. My wife has to take actually a lot of medication. She had, she's had six joint replacements. Oh, wow. So, yeah, both shoulders, both hips, both knees. So... She sets off the alarm in the in the airport when she when we pull into the parking garage. Oh wow! Because <laughs> she's just full of metal. But at the pharmacy, they tried to get they had like three or four cash registers where you could go up and 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 German pharmacies um, are not like American pharmacies. This is for senior citizens one of the primary social interaction points. So. Anyone there is actually qualified to give you advice about the substances that you might ingest. Well, wow. yeah, they have they're they're they they have to go through a three and a half year apprenticeship to be able to work there. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so 
So there's a lot of interaction at the counter and waits are often very long. Mm -hmm. Well, some, the, they tried, they, they finally managed to do it. They started this one to many system, you know, get in one line and go to the next open one. It is really the most efficient way to process a large number of people. Banks have been doing it in America. That's why you have to go through the little maze to get up there so you can go to the next free teller, the, mm -hmm. the big uh, electronic stores, fries right. in the Silicon right. Valley. They had 69 cash registers, but <laughs> one line. <laughs> it's a one to many because it's, a, it's the quickest way to get people through. And, and to get that into Germans' heads is, was, is because they're, they're stubborn. I mean, all the place where I live in Hessen, they're known within Germany for being stubborn, but they're stubborn everywhere. So it took <laughs> a long time for them to, to, to get to that. But you, when, when somebody did not play by those rules that were set up, there was no Darth of people who were willing to point this out, make it clear, explain it to them, and ensure that they did, in fact, then participate. Right. And sometimes that got very loud, but that, but I never saw anybody like one would in America going, oh, gee, I hope this doesn't escalate. And I hope I'm not involved, or, you know. Yeah, uh, right. Kind of thing. Right, right. Because that just, it's just about how, how you interact with people. So, exactly. Um, yeah. And so this whole I, this idea of like in group and out group, is, it's, it is a natural thing. It, it occurs everywhere. Yeah. yeah. But, but it's something that occurs to degrees. And it depends yes. on how attached you are to which degrees it makes it problematic or less problematic. Exactly. For some people it's a very big absolute. For some others, it's you know, it's not not so many. I, I kind of follow Groucho Marx's advice. I'd never belong to a club that would have me as a member. Exactly. So, and so. and see, part of this, I think my reboot along this line happened because of a result of my trauma. Because mm -hmm. when you're traumatizing, you guys probably know uh, you're hyper vigilant. You know, there's an aspect of being hypervigilant and you can confuse feeling abused with being abused. And and that that's basically that's where I'm coming from as far as my take on this through my experience that and out there in Southern California, I, I can't speak, but uh, people that haven't been traumatized you know, to the degree of some people like me, they, I, I've seen that they act more traumatized because they don't understand the skill. <laughs> you know, that not just because you feel abused, just because you're offended, doesn't mean you're, be, just because you're offended at what somebody says, doesn't mean you're being abused. Yeah. Now, I have experienced firsthand when somebody's verbal, offensive way of talking can be abusive. But like you said, it's degrees. It depends on context. My my experience with with uh, being having to having to put myself as like an enforcer, <laughs> you know, which you know that's what happens. You were describing people take the job on themselves. You can't cut in line. This is no. You can't do that. This is why you know. Well, yeah, you run the risk of somebody not liking what you're telling them. Mm -hmm. And I think that I think we have to learn skills of. I mean, all of us individually, I do feel take need to understand the skill of there is. There's degrees of skill of approaching this. I, you know, I had to learn. I just don't go jump in and trying to tell somebody, you know, over the top. You know, just because I have the power. That's just unskillful to me. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn that. But part of the reason I had to learn it is I was still working with uh, a condition of hypervigilance in trying to feel in control because trauma and hypervigilance bring on a need of control. And I had to, over the years, switch it up. No, it's not about control, Mike. It's about do you care how you are interacting with this person, whether they're doing something you like or dislike? Do you, how much do you care of how you're going to, you know, interact with this person, deal with it? And fortunately, um, yeah, there's some smarts in there, you know. And 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 it's interesting. We're still on the topic of existentialism. 
you know, because this is about how are we going to, in the sense I'm meaning, how are we going to exist in this life? I take it, you know, I, how am I, how am I choosing to exist in this life? I don't give a fuck if there's free will or determinism. I really don't because I only know how do I exist in this moment? I, I don't want to be confused by those absolutes <laughs> or the way people frame those as, as absolutes. I don't want to be, they, they frame them as absolutes and I guess because I'm alive and I feel lucky, I know that nothing is absolute, except when I do die. That will be absolute. <laughs> that will be absolute. <laughs> and that also depends on how one defines uh, death. And that yes, and that's to true. How that's you define true. life. That's and, true. And, that's true. And, you know, and so I'm, ag I'm agnostic in the sense that I've, I've never been to Hawaii, so I'll wait and see what the other side has to show me. <laughs> <Just mm. agnostic. laughs> I, I, I can't say one way or the other. <laughs> I have a question, Ed, about your your German standing in line, and if, at how much does the okay? You've got one person who's who's. Uh, deviating from the norm and then you've got another person going to tell him that he him or she or it mm -hmm. or whatever <laughs> we, we, we can term. use the word they in that that, that is great it is grammatically correct to simply say they they yeah, uh, yeah. that is that is actually it's it's got a I thought it, I, yeah i thought that for the longest time yeah uh, and it oh, got to be had to do he and she and now yeah it's, no 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 it, they it's fine they and yeah uh, whatever so so there that. so one person at, at what part does the group influence what happens in a, in other words one person uh, or do, like in a in America, sometimes used to be out here in the West. <laughs> if there was a if there was a fight erupted between two people, oftentimes they just let the two people, you know, and let the strong survive. And mm. Now it's sort of a group thing. People choose sides very quickly, mm. and and the the group. The group consensus, and I think this is normal. Again, it's a it's a, a evolutionary construct that the consensus overwhelms the individual. In other words, mm -hmm. all, all all these people say this is the way you have to do it. So right. that, and then the 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 outlier or whatever has to has to conform. No. And, and does that does that happen, or do they let the two people, no. you know, fight it, it out? No, at that at that moment, let's say in the in the pharmacy, at that moment, um, my experience in America has been many people who are waiting in line will dissociate themselves from that interaction, and so they'll they'll ignore it. In Germany, everyone will be looking. Everybody focuses their attention. All eyes are on you. They're on the person who's speaking and on the person who's doing the violation. So there is there is a very strong group consensus that builds, builds very quickly. Um, as, as you're probably aware, uh, there's a lot of alcohol consumed in this country. Um, it's not considered a recreational beverage, uh, it's considered food. It's it, by law, beer and wine are food. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> as, as a matter of fact, just a little anecdote, since I was just down in Stuttgart, in the Middle Ages in Stuttgart, um, social programs have been around for a very, very long time. And so in the Middle Ages, when, when wine was first legislated as food, um, there, was a, there was a very large poor population in Stuttgart. And so since wine was a food, they gave them wine. And they gave them a daily ration of wine, of two liters a day. They didn't have a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but things never got cleaned up. So 
not around Stuttgart and Baden-Württemberg is the only place in Germany that actually has a law that you have to sweep the street in front of your house on Saturday. So <laughs> to, to clean it up. So they had to compensate for that in another one, but that's a different story. But at any rate, um, and there's, and every little village around here, ours doesn't, it's too small. It's only got 300 people here, but the next one down the road, has got 500 people. Every year they have a, a, like a harvest festival. It's called a Kirmas. And so there's a weekend, starts on Thursday evening, goes to Monday uh, when they finally bury the, uh, the Kirmas, it's called. And so there's a weekend of, you know, drinking and dancing and things going on. And, you know, there's just, there's lots and lots of beer consumed. Um, I was just down in Stuttgart. Uh, next week, they're going to have the 200 year October. It's, they don't call it the Oktoberfest, but it's one week after the Oktoberfest in Munich, uh, the festival in uh, Stuttgart starts. And it goes for, for three weeks. And, and there are just millions of liters of beer consumed. And every once in a while, uh, a fight will break out. And I have never experienced it otherwise in all the time that I've been in Germany. I've been here twice, 11 years the first time, 21 years this time. The moment two people start the fight, 10 people are in there and then we'll separate them. Because you, you don't do that. Unless you're in Bavaria, and then they slap each other and roll around in the dust, and everybody laughs. But that, that's just in Bavaria, but they're a little different than everyone else. But generally speaking, it's not like it was in the Wild West. You know, the Bavarians like to think of themselves as the, te as the Texans of Germany. That's why they <laughs> they, they they do that. But everybody kind of lo looks down on that because that's just not an acceptable way to resolve an issue. It, it just it's unnecessary. Well, so, I, I, I think, and I, I tried to make this point, uh, it may have been Marco's uh, Who Are We post or something, that there's all these factors that, that come into play on people's behavior. Mm -hmm. And one of them certainly is, and, and Amanda talked about this with the rain in Seattle, where you are, the geography, mm -hmm. determines a lot, again, the word determines or influences the, cult, the culture and what people do. If you're, in a, if you're in a small community, like you're talking about, where everybody knows everybody, then it's, it's not to anyone's benefit to have these life and death struggles. But if you're out in the wild west and nobody knows anybody really they're all it's it's basically the wild west it's it's a different uh, mm -hmm. environment and people yes. behave differently but at the root is survival what functions best for that individual and by extension the group if the group helps you survive Mm -hmm. then you, you you tend to practice altru altruism. If, there, if there, there, there will, I agree there will be more. Um, I don't like the word determine. As I, I mentioned, know. I saying, nobody likes it. <laughs> no, and, and I, but I, I, do, I do recognize, and I think it's good to be aware of, the po one of the points that you make that I find um, particularly important is that we have, myriad influences and these influences have varying strengths that either predispose us to do things um one that's this didn't come out a lot in in our talk with amanda but the whole basis of us astrology actually is the idea that you know that configuration of stars under which you were born predisposes you in a particular way i always like to say that people are made up of three three things nature nurture and nativity and and we What's get our the third one nativity so we have nature that's dna we have nurture that's the family the environment and nativity that's your astrological your horoscope and others might say god or Other, others might say something else others might eliminate the, the last one some people are there are people who say it's only dna that's been the nature nurture debate there's because there's other people who would exclusively refer to nurture and, and I, I think exclusive anything is just hoopley of some sort. I mean, uh, how did you figure get it down to one? You know, I'm I'm very content to work with three because 
I've, I, I see a lot of that. I'm not a, like a big astrologer, but I kind of know a little bit about it. And, you know, I can, I can do charts and things like that. But um, one, of, one of the things that I've, one of the little projects I've done recently, because this Tarnas thing did come up, he, he looked at transits over the, over the, that's why I'd asked that question about transits when Amanda was there. And it's, you know, you're born under a certain configuration and then it, here, it's 68 years later, um, all the planets are somewhere else and they're standing in relation to how I was born. And does, does that have any kind of influence on, on what I do or how I do that or what kind of situations I, I end up in? So I, I recently did a six month transit report where I look back for the last six months. I'm a fairly regular and consistent journaler. So I have, so I, I kind of document things as I'm going along. Sometimes it's very mundane. Sometimes I'm just pissed off. And sometimes there is an actual problem uh, that arises and whatnot. And so I looked at that. And so I, I looked at my, my report and I went back through my journal to compare when it said personal situations may be more relevant at this time that I'm using more general terms that shows up in the report. And there seems to be a fairly consistent tracking of of when I'm more likely to get in, I'm going to put it this way, where I'm more likely to get in trouble than in other times. Okay. <laughs> because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I know that Michael, I know you can relate this. I'm my, I'm my own worst enemy. You know, <laughs> you know, I don't need anybody's help to get myself into a pickle, you know, yeah. <laughs> and I do it often enough. And, and, and I, I see that, and I don't, I don't feel that I'm being, made to do something. I only feel that there's an indication here. If I had been aware of the fact, let's go back to what you had said, sometimes it's good to just count to 10, you know, just take a deep breath, send her, be aware, just be aware for a moment, you know. I like the way you put it, pay attention. <laughs> just pay attention. If I had just pay attention, I might have had, I would have still had the situation to work through, but it might have been less. I can't even talk about trauma because I've lived a charmed life, you know. So, um, I, you know, I'm I'm one of the luckiest human beings on the face of the earth, and I don't even believe in luck. So, you know, I got I have that to work out with because I always ended up somewhere where I needed to be. Um, one one of the things, one of the lines I always give to my kids, they'll come up, you know, what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> you know? What did I do to deserve? Uh, and, and I have told them since they were, they can listen to what I'm saying. You never get what you deserve. You only ever get what you need. And you need to deal with what you've got. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether you think you deserve. You know, I, I'm. I agree. Life's unfair. You know, a lot of people get the shitty end of sick. I don't think we need to make a big. I think we need to to help those situations. I think we need to bring some some people don't need to be given the shittiest sticks that they're being given, and that is that's also changeable, you know, because because I believe, and this comes back to our free will determinism, we are predisposed in many ways, and the way I will go about solving a problem is much much different than how my wife will, much different. And sometimes my method is good, sometimes hers is better, and if I can be if I'm aware of that. Now I know when to let her do it and just get out of the way and, and, and let, let the magic happen. Yeah. Because right. it, that's the best way to go. And if, but that, that means I have to be aware of these things. I have to be aware of these influences I have. Now I'm not saying that we can get total uh, acknowledgement and recognition of all those influences. They are so multifarious. They come from within our bodies, outside our body. Our biology plays a huge role in what we're doing, but it's not the only role. Mm -hmm. so that's the nat that's it's the not, nature. Part. Not. That's not. And 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 since and since it is it has been documented, for example, that people through the meditation, visualization, and things like that, and you only need one case to falsify in science. If that person changes his genetic structure, there's a case, for example, where a young boy had um, uh, elephantalism, uh, you know, where that, your body turns into scales, and, and he cured himself of that through visualization. Right. So he changed his genetic structure, I'm going to say it in a very casual way, by thinking it through. Right. Okay. But it's not, it's not, that, it's not that simple mental. That, that's my 
There's no. a deeper connection there that goes beyond just the mere mentality. That's why all these people yeah, are going to go there's, through that. There's a re repetition that has to take yeah, place. Right. Like, and, then, and this is where, you know, art is art or any, you know, bringing a focus of attention. Yeah. And I want to, I want to add to this is Mark referring to, like you said, meditation, but the studies and some of the people I've read, and I can't remember, we actually have this tandem way of focusing that we can focus on, on the eagle in the sky or the butterfly in front of us. We, we can shift our focus. We actually, we have, it's an, a third skill. Sometimes you have to learn how to, you know, open focus, concentrated focus, you know, but there's also science is showing we have this capacity to actually shift between the two to, to work with both forms of focusing. And I, I relate that in terms of martial arts is you actually have to kind of constantly shift back and forth when to strike, when to see the back, you know, you're, you, it, it's, it's being, it's kind of a, that multi-focus is actually being able to be in the zone, the flow, you know, uh, and, 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 and everything in my daily life from since the, Trump, uh, my accident, everything in my daily life puts me in that position. That's how I feel about it now. Everything in my daily life. Yes, I, after this, I will, I will go sit for 30 minutes and shut up and digest everything we said, <laughs> you know, just, but then I'm going to, after that, I'm going to go out in the world and order a pizza or something and interact with people. <laughs> so, you know, I, I've always loved the Zen part. Okay, sit on your cushion, but what what are you doing with sitting on the cushion when you get up and you leave? What are you doing with it? It's not just about just sitting on the freaking cushion as much as is that is important. No, what do you do with it? And that's been that's 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 my passion. <laughs> that's my passion. And I think one of the one of the skills that is needed in this society today, in terms of that, how do we speak to each other? How do we use speech? Uh, I'm influenced by Stephen Jenkinson's of his approach that we, we have forgotten that speech is a gift and it's a power. And yeah, in this country, we have per se the freedom of speech, but and the right to freedom of speech, but that we don't want to be responsible for the way we use our speech. Oh no, heaven forbid, you know, heaven forbid that I don't like the way Donald Trump uses his speech, but I also take responsibility. I don't have to listen to him. <laughs> you know? And when I do listen to him, I try to sort out the content of what he's trying to speak to versus his manner of speaking. I just grates about my skin, but I have to apply in a reverse fashion when it comes to Obama, because I do like him. I have to be more aware of that because I do like him because I let him off the hook too much. I have some of his uh, and listening to what he's doing. So this listening speaking is a concrete way that we need to help our biological, uh, whatever biology is doing with us today, you know, because I think a lot of the reasons that we're here is we just neglect the human being is a powerful animal and we've abused our power. Most power. And I agree with you, Mark, we're the most powerful animal on this planet to the point that we're just, we're self-destructing. So, you know, and I'm tired of it, tired of it. So I go out and I play hippie and a few times in the last week, I've had to interact like the Germans of, of, of a homeless guy that was being rude to a coffee shop, two co coffee shop girls. And I very slowly, but with, he knew if he didn't do what I told him, 
<laughs> I escorted him out the door because he was yelling for profanities. These two girl, coffee girls, baristas, were scared. And there was a room for old people and they nobody was doing anything. And I just cha- I just channeled my past coffee shop bouncer. I'm just cut up and I took him outdoors. I didn't make a scene, but I took him outdoors and I just told him, walk on, walk on. And I knew from talking to him, and this is this is the kind of experience I've had at the coffee shop. The home, there is quite a few homeless people. He was spinning. He was mentally, you know, there a lot of homeless people are mentally mm-hmm. off. Not that they're they can be dangerous, but they're just different than us. They're they're having mm-hmm. a different life experience. And mm-hmm. but at the same time, he had to be held accountable for what he was doing. You know. So I get plenty of practice in what I'm trying to talk about. I get plenty of practice. <laughs> you know. Thank you for listening. Mark, do you have any questions? Questions. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know what your face is say. Your face reminds me of Groucho Marx. <laughs> really? Yeah. His eyebrows and the glasses. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm missing the cigar. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Where's your cigar, Mark? <laughs> uh, I it, it's I'm practicing uh, also in my tendency is when when Ed was talking when you talked. My mind goes really fast, and, and I think of many times I want to jump in and and speak to what you, somebody's just said. Uh-huh. And I'm I'm I think if we were in a in a real cafe, right. sitting around a table, and we had steins of beer or whatever, <laughs> yeah. that's sort of the natural back and forth. That sure. Uh, this is a new way of communicating and and it it's really difficult to mm-hmm. because by the time you're finished speaking i forgot what it, it was i you know that i wanted to say and so i is it important probably not <laughs> so and i think we see that here in these long pauses where, you know, thoughts come in your head, my head. Mm-hmm. And by the time the person's finished speaking, they're gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, so right. was it important? Who knows? Yeah. Right. Uh, my feeling and, is that if it's important, it'll come back. <laughs> uh, may, yeah, maybe and, and most, I, it may not be in this conversation it might be in another one you know, those, those are the ones that freak me out the one I'm sitting somewhere in another conversation and then that thread comes up from like three days ago and I go that's actually what I wanted to talk about there or bring in there well that'll work here so then you have to bring it in hey, but it, I, I hey. think to keep to keep somewhat focused on existentialism a lot of what you've been saying mike i think goes to that third wave existentialism in that there's a there's a it's just so unpleasant to think of and this goes i think to what you were talking about ed there are so many factors, and now with the technology and the neuroscience, we're, we're starting to see more and more of them and become more, and I just listed 20, but there must, there's probably 40 or 50 factors that influence our behavior at any given moment. Right. And if those, were, if, if those were known, then... Oh yeah, you didn't have a choice. Mm. All these factors, and, and and you think you had a choice, and, 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 and that, that's the angst of the third wave existentialism. I I I think you're lowballing the number of factors that are involved. 
I think I just pulled that. I just pulled yeah, that. That's okay. That's all right. We we all know sixty-seven point eight percent of all statistics are made up on the spot, including that. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> right. so, but the point is, I it's this is the this is the uh, maybe the angst part. I know there's a lot. And I know I'll probably never know all of them. I'm, gl I'm glad that I'm aware of as, as many as I am aware of. And I am also aware of the fact at any one time that there are probably more at work. But I don't feel, and this is where, this is where we diverge slightly, I still think, regardless of all that predisposing that these factors are impinging upon me, in the end, at any given moment, moment I have to make a decision. And I believe that being able to make that decision, I can also say no. I can choose to not do anything. Sometimes not doing is doing. Mm -hmm. That's also an option that we we can have. I, I can speak or not speak. I can I can withhold at this time or maybe do it later. Okay. And I and this and as and as limited as it seems to be, in proportion to the smallness of what it seems is the it's an inverse proportion the, the the greater the importance that it is that i can do that that i can make that decision that i actually i because i do believe because i believe that we're made up of multiple factors and all of these other things that that incline us in certain ways but they don't determine us and as long as we're not determined then we still have however small it may seem choice but this it, it's it's klein of a fine as the Germans would say, it's little, but it's but it's fine. It's a, it's a great opportunity that you have, as small as it is, to be able to say this way, that way, or another way, or no, at any at any time, at any given moment, in the course of what we're doing, and and that that ability, that small ability, I think, is very much underutilized by most people. I do think when I look out in the world and the people that I encounter when I'm out there. I do think that they are, just as you described them, Mark, and they are driven by everything that's driving them. And they don't have the slightest bit, I'm sure I'm doing them injustice and I apologize for it in advance, but they don't give me the impression that they have the slightest bit of awareness of what they're doing or what they're up to. You know, and, and, and for me, that, that's very disheartening because they aren't robots. If we were all just determined, that's to me what the robot is. He's been programmed. It's been programmed to do whatever it does. And it's not going to do anything else. It's not going to wake up tomorrow and say, I'm tired of being a robot. I'm going to go do something else. I'm going to go look for a new job or whatever. And that's the difference. But we have lots and lots of people. I guess that's why this whole zombie image came up here in, in the 90s, because it just seems like there's lots of people that are on autopilot all the time. And part of the reason is, I agree, and this, this came up in that discussion, is because people are overwhelmed by that. Well, I'm, the reason I'm not overwhelmed by there's so many factors is I simply say, oh, there's so many factors, I can't think of them all. So I'm no longer overwhelmed. I just well, know and, there's a lot of them. And, and therefore, therefore you're, you're managing the anxiety on whatever level that you could have by being that I could have. You're managing it. <laughs> Right. It's like, OK, well, I'm never going to do myself justice. Oh, well, what the heck? You know, I'll just do the best I can with what I have at the moment, because that's why I am. I'm here. I'm here. I'm now I got to do this. But isn't it the case that especially maybe the early existentialist, the main anxiety that they boiled everything down is the fear of death, right? Played a big role in a lot of what people were doing. But then, you know, when we look back through history, they're, they're doing a two three-part series on Sunday evenings here about the 30-year war. Uh, uh, oh, I'm telling you, I am so glad I was born in the 20th century <laughs> because just life then was just, I, I don't know how people, well, nobody survived, but I don't know how anybody survived for as long as they did because things were filthy, they were dirty, they were violent, they were they were irrational. It, it was just, you know, and, and, and the thing about the 30 years war, God was on everybody's side. <laughs> <laughs> so, so so what has changed i mean syria syria is the latest case of that just a, a friggin nightmare for the people it is, it who are 
who are who live there or yes you know, yeah so the this, people who live there that has to be the absolute nightmare but i keep asking myself why what what's the problem there and that that's what never gets talked about why are americans in syria what what do we have to do in the sovereign another sovereign country what business is out of ours as Amer I'm speaking as an American now. I am going. I don't. I don't get it. Why are you there? Uh, allegedly supporting people who are, you know, uh, how does the saying go? Um, uh, your friends. Your friends aren't. The, no. The enemy of the, the enemy. The, en the of enemy of my friend is my enemy too, or some things like that. You know. So okay. Well, yeah, but don't I do a vetting of who my friends are? You know, these are the people that we were trying to kick out of somewhere else before. Now they're our friends because he happens to dislike, they happen to dislike the same person that we dislike. Well, we can dislike people all we want. We do that all the time. Well, but that doesn't mean that we have to actually take action to well, do that. The, the, cause of, the cause of most of these conflicts since the beginning of time is over resources. It's over, it, it's, it's, it's base, it's economic or it's reproductive resources being being females or resources being food water territory well, well and that translates to money yeah it's, well and this none of this has changed since you know the beginning right but we all but what we are aware of and this is that this is what makes the 20th century different than I'm going to say the the Middle Ages, where I could blame God for everything. Or con. Mr. Nietzsche did us a favor, and he gave us this doubt that maybe there isn't a God. So who's left? Whether it's just me. Well, now I have I have to fess up. I, I believe that the onus then comes to me. And say, well, I have to do something about this. So in the 20th century, we know that that's not necessary to do that. But if if we go back a few. Uh, cafes into the forum. Uh, it was the it was Jeffrey's twenty year plan where he posted a a link of a survey of supposedly the world again mm -hmm. statistics. But you are in the way minority. Most people on the planet still believe God's got a playing a role, and and like yes. you said, God is on their side. Most people are either Muslim, Hindu, Christian, Jew, and a handful of others. Most people, like out of the 7 billion, I don't know, uh, 6 billion. Uh, again, I'm pulling these statistics well, out of nowhere. There, well, I, there, the, the statistic that I do know is there are 1.2 billion who are considered Christian. 1.1 billion that are considered um, um, Muslim. Muslim. And there's, it's pretty hard to get a grip on how many Buddhists and Hindus are running around in the Asian continent. There's vast parts of the, the earth, like communist, the former communist China, that they cleaned up their act, so we don't call them that anymore. But in China, for example, where you know Taoism was widely spread, it was not, not widely practiced because Mao didn't allow for those kinds of things. So, so we get about you know those two big chunks. Um, there are only 13 million Jews on the planet. Huh? Yes, five million of them live in the United States. Five million of them live in Israel, and three million of them are spread out everywhere else. Wow! But so, they have. Yeah. They have a huge, huge influence. It, was it you, you, Ed, talking about the Bible the other? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. As a yeah, well, as perfect word in the book. Culturally, you, you can't think them out of the picture. You know, culturally, you, you, that's just not possible. That's that's the whole, that's Fry's whole approach to, you know, how how do we get to the literature that we have here in the West? And it all kind of comes out of that the myth structure that is given by the Bible. That, that's his fundamental thesis. And, and I, think he's got, I think he's got a point. I, I want to I ask you, because I was just reading, how much the Roman Empire has put in, uh, influenced Christianity as it moved through Europe what? and the world. 
Well, a lot because the Christ, that's the whole thing about Christianity. We, we say Christianity as if it were of one bolt of cloth. Exactly. Right. But there are, but there are three primary branches. There's, there's like Roman Catholic, there's Catholic, there's Protestant, and there's Coptic. So the Coptic is a very small group. And under the Catholics, you've got two big headings, Orthodox and Roman. And under the Orthodox, you've got another branch. And under the Protestant, it, it drops down and then it just shatters into millions and millions of little groupings. That, Where's that, the Episcopalians? Well, that's the thing. They're, they're Protestants only in the sense that they don't recognize the Pope. Oh, okay. That, 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 that was Henry VIII's big deal. Okay. He changed nothing in the church. That's why to this day in England, if the, if the local priest is, is ill or can't perform the mass, they can call the Episcopalian over and he can do it. Yeah. So I was, ra- I was raised Episcopalian. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually it's Anglican. Episcopalian is the American version of that, but it's, it's the same difference when you get right down to it. They all have these minor variations. Cause like you said, Mark, the culture that you're in and where you end up, whether you're in the Wild West or whether you're in, in, in Boston, has an influence on how things look and how you structure things. That, that also has an influence. And so we tend to have these varieties of flavors. Now, now you also have, you know, the rapturists, you have the evangelicals who are, you know, who have a huge influence in the United States because there's so many of them. But they're all also not of one bowl of cloth. They have some basic fundamentals that they agree on so that they're not each other's throat, you know, day in and day out. But when push comes to shove. Well, that was, I think that was the point I made in responding. And and, and I apologize again. I didn't respond to each one of your points. No, I have to. But yeah, my brother was just spending overnight here unplanned. It was, but he is a born again, evangelical Christian Mm -hmm. and, and sort of, an understanding we've come to have between us is that's not something we talk about. We don't talk yeah. about it, right? Yeah. yeah. When, I, when I visit mine. And, and we, cla- we clashed, yeah. but, but now we're getting along really well, but that's sort of a, un, we don't go there. We no, talk we, about. We bracket that because, yeah, you bra- it's reasonable he, to bracket that. He can go. He can go anywhere in the United States and walk into a Baptist church and be welcomed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, And right. I, I can't. I can't go anywhere and be well, welcomed unless I have a lot of money. Unless I have a, a lot of money. Yeah, and you, you have a lot. Yeah, you can. There's different. There's different things that that give us acceptance. But that's that's with any organization. You know, if you're a Mason, you can go anywhere in the world where there's Masons, and you'll be welcome. You know, if you if you were, uh, you know, most people, uh, if you're Catholic, you can go anywhere and be welcome. Now, when I go other places, when I, I had to do a lot of European projects, so I got I got to go to a lot of different countries. And when I was in Paris, I always went. I'm not Catholic, but I always went down to Notre Dame, to the cathedral in Paris, and listened to a mass because there's always one going on in Paris somewhere. You can always find a mass in Paris. You know. And the best one, the best one I ever, I ever encountered was at the Sacred Heart up on uh, Montmartre, which is up over Paris. It was Good Friday. I'll never forget this. We went, we were out, my wife and I were, we were out there and you have to take an incline to get up there and then you have to walk around half the mountain and up these steps. And there's this huge platform up to the steps that go up to the church. This is a magnificent, magnificent structure. And we came up around there, and you could just you could smell the hash just kind of like floating out here towards the yeah. And we came around the corner, and there were there were there was a, hundreds of young people sitting on these steps, looking out over Paris, the city of lights, and there were fireworks in the distance. You know, I don't know who was. You froze. Ed, maybe we're throat. maybe we're done. Yeah, we reached. Uh, we're yeah over two hours. Yeah. Yeah, we well, shouldn't start. You you guys are. Well, I have a stable, unstable internet connection. It says here. Okay. Am I moving again? Yeah, yeah you are. Now. Yeah, okay, you're moving now. All right. So, 
Anyhow, and these these people are looking at out at Paris, and right behind them in Mont Watson, the one thing about that is they say a perpetual mass there, 24-7. There's a mass going on in that, that cathedral. They all had sitting with their backs to it. And I had to think about the Luther translation when John the Baptist is in the wilderness running around, and he says, he says, I'll speak metanoiate, metanoiate, because the kingdom of God is at hand. And this metanoiate, Luther translated as turn around. Mm-hmm. Turn around, turn around, the kingdom of God is at hand. Mm-hmm. And I'm walking up there going, okay, I see what Luther was thinking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not that he was right, but I can see what he was thinking in that moment. It was a, it was a very profound experience, and it was fun to sit down there and listen to the guy go through his, his routine because it goes on all the time and all the time. I've also done that in Milan. I've done that in, in Barcelona. Anywhere I get the chance, I get on to the local. They all have really big, pretty cathedrals. And you listen to them because it's as close as you can get to Latin. When, right. I, was in San, when I was in San Jose, there was one small little chapel about two blocks from our where we lived. And they still did the old Latin mass. Yeah. But they're not there anymore because the two monks that were still still hanging yeah. on aren't hanging on anymore. You know, so. I, I just think I, I feel fortunate of being raised, you know, through the 60s of being exposed. And uh-huh. he, even though it was stressful going through the 60s and, you know, because I have locked in my head an image of black and white of when they were hosing down in Alabama and the dogs and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even that. But I feel fortunate that I was raised in a time that I was challenged to at least uh, consider somebody that's different without needing to cling to my group. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And my grandfather had a lot of a lot to do with this. That that he felt that we should at least listen to you know it's the a per stack per stack. Pival kind of point of view of at least consider different points of view. And I'm fortunate I've been in the military and traveled. And I think that's what's helped the, where, where it's, it's different in the world, but it's also more stressful is we are being put in to rub up against different points of view and try to work it out and try mm-hmm. to feel it. And there, you know, it, it's a mess because some people just don't want to go, okay, this is how I am, but I don't need to go out of my way to change you because it's my job, <laughs> you know, to change you. But we do have people like that in the world. Unless you belong to one of those groups who feels that yeah. it is their job to change other people. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I, I, personally, I personally don't belong. I, and that's, I don't even. <laughs> in that sense, I follow the way I was in high school. I, always, I didn't belong to any group. I knew the, I was a wrestler. I knew the the theater people, I knew the drug addicts because my cousin, you know, the druggies. Uh, mm-hmm. I tried to hang out with cheerleaders, but that was didn't work to my <laughs> advantage. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying is I developed I, I used to feel bad about it because of being a teenager, you know, because mm-hmm. you want to belong to some group. But now I'm going, hell, that's, you know, and I appreciate all the groups. It's not, you know, I, I, I like there's good people in all groups, but there's some people in a group that I just have to know that like you say, Mark, with your brother, I've had the same thing in my family. I, there's just certain things in our family. We've got with my two sisters, we've gotten to the point. We don't talk about certain things. We've gone through the kind of rubbing up against each other, but now we just are focused of being there for each other and trying to show as much love. Mm-hmm. No need to take that, sh- go shovel that shit anymore. Don't need to shovel it. Okay, guys, that's a good place to wrap it up. <laughs> it is. No, it is. Those are those are words to live by. All right, yeah. live and let. Live. Thank you, guys, very yeah. much. All right. Well, yeah. Next week, we'll see what Mark Grove digs up. Well, we'll see what comes up. Maybe you come up with another good idea, Mark. Who knows? <laughs> okay. Thanks, Ed. Okay. Thank you. So you guys take Bye-bye. care. Bye. See, see you. Ya.